On today's show, it is a new week. We have new content on the Lockdown Hawks podcast. It's actually part one of two with a new guest on today's podcast talking all about the young guys on the roster, plus some Olympic talk and more. And all that is coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1778 of the Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Sunday evening here in early August. It's today's podcast is brought to you by the folks at the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app right now, create an account, and then use promo code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. I also want to encourage you at the top of the podcast, as I always do here at Locked On Hawks, to make us your first listen each and every day. Please check us out and subscribe to the podcast. On all the audio platforms you might, that you might enjoy, like Apple and Spotify, as well as Overcast and more. Plus, we are on YouTube, so please like this episode as you are watching it. And also, please subscribe to that platform that enable, enable notifications so you actually know when the podcast is going to be going live on YouTube. And today's show is actually going to be part one of two with myself and a new guest. David Lee will be joining me to talk all about the Hawks' young players and a little bit of Olympic talk at the top of the podcast. We've been very busy on the show in recent days. Last week, I know we're kind of in the dead zone now, but... We did six episodes in like six days recently. It's been very busy still talking all about the Hawks roster, what's to come, the transaction cycle, talked about Dom Barlow, the newest addition of the Hawks roster, Bruno Fernando moving on to Toronto and all of that fun stuff in the last couple of days and weeks. But more to come all summer long. And without any further delay, here we go with part one of myself and David Lee. I'm joined now by a first time guest of the podcast. I've been looking forward to talking to for a while. David is joining me at D Lee for three. What's going on, man? Thanks for being here. Man, I'm so happy to be here. I appreciate you reaching out, and it's, it's going good. I mean, I feel like things are finally looking up for the Hawks. It's been a fun summer watching all the young guys soup from Summer League to the Olympics, so I'm looking forward to speaking with you today. Yeah, I appreciate it, and uh, I, I think you'll – you probably know this. You get tagged on this stuff, but, like, anytime people – people are like, you, you should have David on. I'm like, yeah, that, that was my plan all along. I was going to yeah. do it, but it's a good time to do it. Uh, we'll talk about some young guys along the way, but uh, we're recording this Sunday night. It's August 4th. Uh, it's actually really topical right now. That wasn't on purpose, but here we are. Uh, the Olympics are happening still. And really, if there was one game that Hawks fans should be watching the entire Olympics, it's probably the one on Tuesday morning. Uh, because if you're not following this closely, it's Australia against Serbia, which means the two guys on the Hawks roster, uh, Dice Daniels for Australia, Bogey for Serbia, 8.30 in the morning Eastern time. Not the greatest time in the world for people that have to work like me, but I'll be able to watch it at some point. Um just around that, we'll start there. I mean, the Olympics are happening. I know you're watching as I'm following you on socials. Uh, what have you observed? I guess we'll start with Bogey because Bogey is the yeah. old guy. The rest of these guys are young guys that we're going to talk mm-hmm. about. Uh, Bogey's been doing Bogey things. He had, he had a monster game over the weekend. But what have you been seeing from him? Is it just kind of the same old Bogey stuff or anything pop out to you? Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting with Bogey because obviously with DeJounte off the roster, there's been a lot of conversations about, okay, where does, where does the shot creation come from? And I think – because he's been sort of in that bench role for so long, people sort of forget how gifted he is um, at creating shots, not just for himself, but for others. And I think when he plays with someone like Jokic, you can really see that to its fullest extent. I mean, there were some moments, especially in the game where he had, right away, he had 30 points, eight assists, 77% from the field, (laughs) 92.75, I think, true shooting percentage, unreal stats, like 30 points on 14 shots. Um, But I really think he's, he's very meticulous. I think he's a lot more, uh, like his pace, his decel, all that. I think he's gotten a lot better at that, weaving through pick and rolls. And I think I, I see some of that translating, especially with like Anyeka is really good at rolling and then sealing off the big and then allowing that lane to the rim. Things like that I think could translate. Um, but I think in general, I mean, Bogey, is, he's, just, he's a phenomenal offensive player. That's what he's always been. Um, but I do think we could probably see him sort of extend his his playmaking roles a little bit more um, now that that's kind of you know up in the air about who's going to take that, that usage. I mean, it's going to be – what about 30% of usage that's going to have to be accounted for. So I do expect him to scale it up a little bit. And from how he's playing in the Olympics, I'm pretty uh, excited about the fact that he could fit that role. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's worth noting if people don't watch a ton of FIBA, like FIBA and the NBA are not always exactly the same. And you right. know, a lot of guys, a lot of guys scale up and Bogey's not alone, not alone in that, but it is true. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned it, but I always feel like I'm banging this drum. So people are going to think I'm repeating myself, but Bogey just remains perpetually underrated, I think, by a oh, lot yeah. of different people. Um, even people locally, it's kind of like people know he's good that watch the Hawks mm-hmm. every game, but it's like he's just he's just a safety blanket, right? He's he's what he is. But you talk about it, 
he's the number one perimeter option for Serbia, which allows him to kind of cook in that way. But I think that he he does have a lot of ball skills, a lot of on ball, like a lot of distribution skills that he doesn't always get to show. Oh, maybe doesn't choose to show a lot in the NBA. Mm-hmm. But without Dejounte, you know, there's this whole debate that we don't have, we don't have to do now about who's going to start at the two and all these things. But one thing I know, or I'm pretty confident in, is that Bogey's going to be really heavily featured anytime Trey is off the court because. 100%. He's their second best playmaker on the perimeter right now on the offensive end of the floor, pretty clearly. And you know, I think he gets the rep as maybe like not not necessarily just a shooter, but like that's the first thing you say about Bogey, right? Is mm-hmm. Bogey's a great shooter, and it's true he's a great shooter. But I think that it's, it is a good time if Hawks fans haven't been watching closely to kind of see what Bogey can do in a bigger role that's designed for him. But also like he just takes on usage. You you mentioned the assists. Um, it's a good kind of flashpoint for what might be happening now because no matter what happens, no DeJounte, even if it's a lot of usage for guys like Kobe and Dyson, who we'll get to, or Risa Shea, Bogey's number two behind Trey, basically, when it comes to perimeter, uh, perimeter stuff yeah. right now. And I think the thing is, too, it's as we mentioned that sort of starting conversation, I think what the Hawks have the ability to do now is be a lot more malleable night to night. Obviously, when you put up, when you give up that much equity for DeJounte Murray, um, even if that fit becomes untenable, you just can't really rationalize putting him on the bench. You know, it's yeah. it's sort of more so like I think we can be more matchup dependent from night to night. I don't think either Dyson or Bogey. I mean, Bogey's really he's accepted the role he's had for a while, and I don't think there'd be any sort of blowback or or frustration from him if he's not consistently starting. And I think when you're going against a team that has a dynamic guard in the backcourt, which is pretty much most teams, maybe Dyson Daniels is the best option for that night. So I I do think it's going to come up again when they play against each other. (laughs) Dyson has been incredible defensively. Bogey has been a flamethrower. So it's like two really competing forces. And I think they they represent two different areas of need for the Hawks. So it's going to be like a microcosm of the debates that's going to surround this team in the offseason. But uh, I just encourage people to enjoy it. I think it's going to be a great game. I think both these teams are pretty evenly matched. Yeah, to that end, I think it's pretty clear that Dyson's going to guard Bogey because oh, yeah. Dyson's the perimeter stopper for Australia. Bogey is clearly the number one option for Serbia. Well, that'll be a little bit weird if you're a Hawks fan because it's like, mm-hmm. you know, this will be the last time you see those guys do that at the same time. But it's a good test for both of them because, 100%. you know, there are there are guys in this tournament, especially if Australia happens to win, Dyson will have to guard some high level guys the rest of the way. As long as they keep, you know, they're going to face the U.S. if they win. Uh, but that's one, one thing to say out loud. The winner of this game is probably going to face the U.S. Not definitely. The U.S. could lose in theory to Brazil, but probably going to be the U.S. And then Dyson will have another challenge in that game. But for now, watching Dyson defend Bogey for the majority of 40 minutes probably is going to be a lot of fun. Um, a good way to bridge to Dyson, because I want to talk about him anyway, even Olympics and out of Olympics. But he's been really, really, really good this whole run, not just in, in the Olympics, I feel like, with Australia. I know we were watching, a lot of us were watching their tune-up games because mm-hmm. he's it's tough to watch right now, and it's it's a, it's a new guy on the Hawks. But to me, it's not that it's been shocking to me because I was pretty excited about Dyson and was pretty outwardly excited about what he's going to be able to bring. But if anything, he's probably exceeded expectations in the last you know handful of games, both in the Olympics and then prior to them, what have you seen from him that either surprised you or just maybe didn't surprise, but kind of confirm what you might have thought um, post trade? Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is his comfortability offensively. But I, I'll say, like, his immediate mark on the NBA and the Hawks in particular will be the defense picking up full court. He sets the tone, he gets up in the ball handlers. He's really smart off the ball as well. When he played France in that tune up game, he had five steals and probably had at least three deflections that didn't actually turn into steals. So he's incredibly, he's a great defensive playmaker, but at the same time, he's super disciplined. He doesn't foul. Um, he barely gambles. So it's like all these different things that make him a super positive defender. And so all the growth that we need to see from him really to make him like a, a true starter, I think, will be on the offensive end. And so far, it's about shooting about, I think, a little bit above 40% on around four attempts per game. Now, these aren't, you know, super difficult attempts. Part of the yeah. defensive plan is, okay, like, well, we have to contain Josh Giddy or we have to contain Patty Mills. And so he is that swing pass where they're able to get that up. Uh, but the important thing is, is that he's knocking it down. I think he's one of those players where it's like he may never be a good free throw shooter, which is weird. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I don't want to put him obviously like with someone like Luca, but sometimes there's just guys who can shoot the ball but can't make free throws. Uh, it, that's kind of been the trend. He's never really been above a 70% free throw shooter. And that's what it's looking like in the Olympics. But as a secondary ball handler, making the right pass, running a little bit of pick and roll, spotting up. I think he's looked way more comfortable. And I've had people respond and, and let me know about, like, especially from the FIBA World Cup or even the, in the previous international competitions, he wasn't getting these minutes. He wasn't closing games. And he, he's also such a great defender that they were comfortable leaving with T. Steibel at home, who's been a mainstay for Australia. So I think 
a lot of compliments towards the type of player that he's grown himself into be into being and a lot of growth, especially, you know, we're talking about just a year. So uh, I, I do think he has a lot more growth or a lot more room to grow as an, as an offensive player. But from what I've seen in the Olympics, I think he can eventually get to be a positive. He's already a positive starter. Let me get that right. The, yeah. Just by, based off the defense and the other things he does. But if he can get to a league average and we're talking about four or five attempts per game, then you're talking about one of the best starters in the NBA. That's not a star. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors and passion, drive, and patience on the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive at eBay Motors. They have everything you're looking for to maintain your vehicle, really everything you need possible to maintain your vehicle, level it up as well to peak performance. They have superchargers, they have roof racks, they have exhaust kits, LED headlights, and much more. Whether you're into speed, into power, or into style, they have you covered across the board at eBay Motors. And they have over 122 million parts. That's a lot of parts for your number one ride or die, and you'll always find exactly what you're looking for at eBay Motors. They also have eBay's guaranteed fit, which means your parts is guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber, but crucially, you are not burning any cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices that you're looking for, it's easy to turn that car or truck or SUV, whatever you have, turn it in to the MVP and bring home that win that you are seeking with eBay Motors. Keep it ride or die alive right now at ebaymotors.com. One more time, the place to go is ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fit as long as U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Yeah, I want, to, I want to come back to the defense, but while, while on the offense real quickly, you know, it's one of those things where he's been so efficient in these in this setting. Like you mentioned, three-point shooting, even two-point shooting has been pretty good as well, like four and a half assists per game, right. averaging like 11, 12 points a game. And, you know, FIBA's different, it is, but like you said, it's not like he's playing a role that's like totally out of pocket where he'll be. Some guys in his set in his setting would be like the guy on their international team, and he's not. He's he's in a supporting role offensively. It's kind of funny to say that teams are like playing through Patty Mills instead of that, but it's true. And P- Patty's like you know former Hawks legend, of course. Uh, right. Patty's a great example of a guy like is going to shine in FIBA. What like, kind of let him cook a little bit more? But to me, it feels like, and I haven't. I will always admit this. I've not watched every minute of Dice Daniels the way that I have of all these Hawks guys because I've I watched a lot of film since the trade happened and I watched him before that, but not every minute like I have with Trey or some of these guys. But it seems like he's shooting the ball with confidence, which is really, really encouraging. That's the big qu- – I mean, it's not like it's breaking news. That's the big question with him is like can he make enough shots because everything else, and we'll get, in, we'll get into it in a second, is pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for me it's – and Quinn's always going to do this too, but – they're gonna they're gonna make him fire. Like they're gonna encourage him to fire. It's especially open threes. You can't pass on those. That's the, it's not like a big secret. But it feels like you sh- not not only just making shots, but shooting them with confidence. And just you mentioned it, but the the growth he's done within the Australian program. He was like not a lock to be on the team in Australia. Like that was discussed a lot like a month or two ago. And then he just basically forced himself on this team with the way he's been playing. And now he's playing big minutes and shooting the ball. Again, not gonna he's not bombing, he's not taking tough shots, but he's taking the shots that he should take and he's making enough of them. And that's kind of all you need to do for now. Obviously, the next step is the next step, but in the meantime, the Hawks just need him to take the shots and take them confidently. Yeah, and I think the confidence is the biggest thing for him. I don't I don't really doubt his ability to the bit like I don't think he's like a, a broken shooter in terms of his form or in terms of like what he's actually put on film. I, I do caution that like they had Fred Vincent, who is yeah. probably the best shooting coach in the NBA. So I mean, he did two years with Fred, or sorry, three years, I think. Yeah, two, two, two yeah, two years yeah. with Fred, and and I'm not saying that means it's unfixable, but I mean, Fred was able to make Herb Jones a dynamic three point shooter, Najee Marshall, Brandon Ingram. He kind of retooled and rebuilt their jump shots. Um, so I think it's, I don't think it's necessarily a form thing with him. I just think it's about getting those that volume up. Uh, but he's he's taken a couple that I don't think he would have taken a year ago, and I definitely don't think he would have taken within the context of the Pelicans' offense. And I also just want to remind people the Pelicans' offense was one of the worst spacing wise mm-hmm. of any team in the NBA. So even if he he is that player that guys would help off of, but it's because they could shrink the floor against that team. So um, I think is he's going to have a much easier time getting those shots uh, that he's capable of knocking down in Atlanta. Yeah, and what I would say to like there's been a lot of talk about this, but what you know. He's shot 31% in his career in New Orleans, about the same both years. Not huge volume at all, but not like zero volume. Like, it's weird. The way that people talk, some people talk about him, is like he's like a total non-shooter. And that, I wouldn't say that. You know what I mean? He's kind of in that yeah, m- middle area where he's not hes not a good shooter. At least he hasn't proven to be a good shooter. But it's not broken. And he's taken, and he's, you know, I think it was like five for 100. Like, that's, that's a pretty low number for a guard, but it's not like one for, you know, he's hes willing to take them. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned the Fred Minson thing, because like, if you want to be skeptical, you probably could be. 
but I feel like he'll still be encouraged to take them in Atlanta. In fact, if I had to bet right now, I don't know if you agree with me or not, I think he will take more per 100 than he took in New Orleans in Atlanta. I'm pretty confident about that, actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> At least in year one. Yeah, they're going to make them. Yeah. They're going to make them get him up for sure. I mean, I think also just right. like it's it's been a priority for Quinn, like you said, to get guys to space the floor. Like I think ideally in his in his ideal system, it'd be like you know everyone's a threat. I think the way that he's prioritized getting on Yeka those looks too, you know, like out of timeouts with pin downs, ATOs, um, they're going to put him in a position to succeed. And I do think he has all the other touch indicators to be like, okay, well, eventually he can knock these down. Like dynamic in the, in the short roll at, with a float game. He has good touch around the rim. The ball comes off his hands soft. It's not like a line drive. Very far from someone like a Markel Fultz. You know, it's it's a functional jump shot. I just think it's it's more so of a mental thing with him. And I really, I do, I see growth. I think it could happen for sure. I'm going to throw a curveball at you. And cause I want to make sure I don't forget to ask you this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been like six weeks since the trade as we're talking. Uh, what was your reaction to the trade? And I'm talking about the DeJounte trade. Cause obviously yeah. Dyson was Dyson in addition to the picks. Like it was the Dyson and Larry Nance kind of a throw in. What was your original reaction other than just like DeJounte's traded? Like, did you, did you, were you excited? Cause I, there was obviously a big split. Uh, mm -hmm. And people that watch the Hawks, and mm -hmm. uh, I think I know because I think I was following you. But I want to make sure I'm not wrong. What did you think about the deal? And maybe from there, where have you gone in the last six weeks? Because I know of, of all people should know this. I know you've been watching stuff. You're cutting clips. You're, you're watching this stuff. So like, if anybody's gonna maybe not not necessarily change their mind, but like have some observations since then, where's right. your kind of journey taking you in the last six weeks? That's the trade. Oh yeah, journey is a great word for it. I remember the first like reports didn't include Dyson. So that yeah. really threw me in a loop. I was like, wait a minute. It was I'm like Larry Nance and two picks. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. That, I was upset. I was definitely upset. I didn't think DeJounte's value was, you know, crazy. Um, yeah. It was going to be a short list of teams that were interested, but I was, I was not going to be happy with that. Um, once Dyson was involved, I was all over. I was like, yes, let's go. Um, I have been advocating for Dyson for a long time. Like I've, I, I really wanted him, uh, I just really love low usage guys who make good decisions and are great defenders. I think that's a like a requisite for a team that's going to be a serious team in the NBA. Um, and and he has he's that right now, but he could be so much more too. I think he's he's still got point guard skills. He's still got room to grow, and I, I really love that. Um, and then in terms of my opinion evolving, honestly, I was. I got more and more optimistic. I started drinking that Kool Aid a little bit more, but like, <laughs> that's all right. I've already been watching. Like, I'm generally an optimist, you know, so. I try to look for the good in it, things anyway, but I think the biggest thing is that the Jonte and Trey just weren't working. Like historically, yeah. there's never been two all stars that are that bad together. They're one of three duos since I think 2004. I think when I pulled the data that have a negative plus minus with both ne negative net rating with both of them on the floor. So there's really no uh, precedence for two guys that are supposed to be all star level players being that bad. On the floor together and then you look at what trey has excelled with and that's with guys who can defend or a low usage guys who can spread the floor and you see that team get informed around him i do think there's maybe a cap on how much you can play trey ball not because like i don't think he's good enough but i don't think like eventually you're going to run into a team that's going to throw everything they have at him so there's still growth that we need from jalen johnson there's still growth we need from dyson and kobe buffkin and all these young guys um, but I just became more and more optimistic, if I'm going to be honest with you, as I as I really dove deep into Dyson. I've, I, the Pelicans are one of my favorite teams in the NBA. I love Brandon Ingram, so I would watch them as much as I can anyway. And Dyson was on my list as one of my favorite players as well. But when I looked into the numbers, I looked into how engaged he is on every possession. I looked into like the pride he takes defensively, the precedence he sets defensively. I think he's one of the one of a short list of maybe three guys that I would want as like a long term backcourt partner next to Trey. And Larry Nance isn't a bum either. You know, like that's no. a really good trade throw-in. And then EJ Liddell was also a good trade throw-in, which honestly, like, I didn't want us to trade him away, but <laughs> it's I, all right. I, yeah, it was no. a great trade. I, I Honestly, like, I felt better and better as time went on. Yeah, I, you know, I had the same reaction on some level, like, and I, I banged the drum a lot about, you know, it was just time, the trade Ajante thing, not to rehash it. It just, it just didn't work. And, there, it, and it wasn't going to be fixed, I don't think. It's not anybody's fault. It just, it just didn't mm -hmm. work. And... I also was a big Dyson guy going back to the draft um, two years ago. So like he kind of checks the boxes that I like. And of course, as we'll get into now a little bit, actually, you talked about it, but his defense is the, is really the, we, we, love, we love, live with the offense, but his defense is really the, of course, the appeal. Um, 
And I, even watching more and more of him, like I already knew he was a good defender. I asked around people in the world that watched him every day, and they're like, yeah, defense is legit, no question mm-hmm. about it. The numbers tell, tell that story. All the numbers tell that story defensively. Then you watch him, and it's maybe even better <laughs> than yep. you think it's going to be. And then you watch him, and again, FIBA's different. I'm not going to tell you that FIBA's all, all-knowing, but he's been great defensively in, this, in these settings. He's just turning the water off on guys, the mm-hmm. size. You mentioned the partnership with Trey. Yeah, it'd be great if Dyson's offense could come along a little bit more, but he does have those guard skills. Like that was never really the question with him. But his defense, just to have somebody else on this podcast other than me, and I know Tyler gets is, is kind of on my side too. I think you are too. But like his defense is really that good, isn't it? I, I know you're watching the film. Tell people that I'm not crazy. His defense is actually that good. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time, and Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball. They help you get your baseball tickets, battle tickets, and anything else you're looking for faster and easier with last minute deals, all in prices, viewing receipts, and the lowest possible price guarantee. Game Time is a fantastic option for everything across the board when it comes to ticket purchasing. I've been using the app for a long time now. It's coming handy for me many times with Braves tickets or Falcons tickets, et cetera, plus shows and concerts across the city of Atlanta and beyond. Save big when buying last minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, and much more. And they have flash deals as well. You can save big there and even save even more when choosing a section and then letting Game Time choose the seats within that section for you. They have an awesome feature as well that really appeals to me where you can actually toggle to show the total up front. No surprise fees. You get to the checkout screen at the end. Also get a panoramic view of the seats in the app before you buy them and you are actually getting the lowest possible price with the folks at Game Time. Take all of the guesswork out of buying tickets with the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app right now, create an account, and then use promo code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create that account and use promo code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase at Game Time. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Oh, no, you're absolutely not crazy. I think he has <laughs> as like the best premier defender in the NBA, and I don't say that jokingly. I I think he's that talented. I think he's that strong. Um. If you go and watch him play against LeBron and see how he's able to withstand those body bumps and then go watch him play against a dynamic guard to see how he shuffles his feet. We're talking about a guy who's fourth in deflection. But mind you, he's played behind Herb Jones, okay? So right. even with Herb on the floor, he'd be taking primary assignments, especially against guards. Um, he's fourth in deflections for 75 possessions last season. He's third in steals for 75. He contested 34% of shots at the rim while he was on the floor. He's in the 88th to 96th percentile in advanced stats defensively. I, I generally think he is one of the best defenders in the NBA. And that was in a very low usage role as well. Like, I, And I mean that in terms of minutes, and that's why I'm using per 75 possessions. But yeah, yeah you're not crazy at all. The Hawks finally got them someone who's going to take pride defensively. So I guess my question for you is, and I've gotten this question as well. I don't really know how to feel about it. But do you think he's a culture changer? You know, obviously with a young guy, that'd be a lot to ask for him to come in and be like, okay, let's get everyone else to play defense. Yeah, the Hawks themselves don't have great defensive culture, but do you think he can come in and sort of set that tone, and guys will sort of follow that lead, or do you think he might be, by, you know, by himself in some moments out there? Yeah, I think it's it's a good point. Like, I hesitate to put that on a twenty one year old. You know what yeah. I mean? I think it can help, and you know, Tyler's been saying this. And I he's the best perimeter defender they've had since like Tabo. Like, it's it's really mm-hmm. that like. My guy, DeLon Wright, is really good. He's not as good as Dyson Daniels. You know what I mean? Yep. So, like, they haven't had – I mean, they had Chris Dunn on the team, but Chris Dunn was hurt the whole year. Chris Dunn's, like, that kind of level defender, but he wasn't around. Um, so, having a guy – you know, they've done more than just acquire Dyson. Like, we won't get into it a lot on this podcast probably, but, like, just some insulation around them defensively. I think Reese is going to be a good defender in time. You know, they have enough – they don't have a lot of weaknesses defensively. Outside outside of Trey and Bogey's still probably a weakness. Um they're not so bad right now. Like they've gotten better def- talent wise, better depth wise uh, defensively. Even someone like David Roddy, who like isn't anything great, is going to be fine defensively. Big, bulky guy, knows, knows how to play. Um, you know, culture change is interesting. I feel like he's going to immediately make them so much better because of what he's replacing. And that's not a shot at anybody individually, but they have not had a, prim- a point of attack defender of any kind for a while. You know, that, yeah. you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. the, the, the theory around the DeJounte thing was like, he was going to like suddenly change the culture in that way. Honestly, yeah. the theory about DeJounte two years ago was going to be good. And obviously he was not capable of doing that defensively. I think that's not really a, his, that's more of a, him being miscast than it's his fault is mm-hmm. what I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but Dyson actually can do that for you. I just, I just wonder culture is interesting because like the 21 year old doing that on a new team when he just got there is a lot mm-hmm. to ask. But I do think it like 
lead by example kind of thing where, and also just the way it filters down, you know this, but it's so much easier for your bigs. If your guards are not getting, are not getting blown through immediately and you're playing, you're playing defense on defense. You know what I mean? Like you're already, you're just retreating all the time. And you know, I know my love for Clint is well documented, but Clint and Onyeka, <laughs> same thing. I, I, it's not just a Clint thing. You make your bigs job impossible if, when your guard play is as bad as it's been for the Hawks the last couple of years defensively. Nobody, maybe maybe Prime Rudy could save it, but nobody else can. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And now I think just having Dyson there, having other. I mean, it's not he's not he's 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 the number one option on that on that call list, but playing more Kobe, who we'll probably talk about later in this podcast. Like Kobe's another guy who's probably going to help them in that area. So yeah, the the answer is kind of yes, kind of no, because it's I don't want to put that on a twenty one year old guy. And he, by the way, he is twenty one despite playing the last two years yep. in the NBA, but. Yeah, I'm really, really, really encouraged by it. And I feel like if he starts and plays 30 minutes a game, which isn't like a total lock, but is certainly possible, he could be like all defensive team level, like as soon as this this year, next year. Granted, you probably have to have your team success, which mm-hmm. I hate that just as a sidebar. I hate the fact that like people are not smart enough to differentiate between team and individual stuff on this, but you know, but you know I'm you're laughing because you know I'm right. Like, yeah. Unless you're unless you're like unless you already have the rep. Your defense has to your team your team has to be good defensively or you won't get the attention. But I feel like he's kind of already there for people that watch a lot of stuff. I think, like you said, his impact, there's a chance that he improves us so much defensively. Maybe right when we finish what 27th or 28th. There's yeah, a chance that he moves us up, he moves us up to you know that middle of the pack. Um, and I think what you said about the supporting cast around him that sort of insulates his defensive capabilities and also complements him a lot better, a lot of length, a lot of versatility. I think Dyson comes in and immediately makes, you know, even, you know, Clint Capella's drop coverage a little bit more viable because he can oh, get yeah. over the screen. So it's like the Hawks had to rely a lot on blitz, um, blitzing, more aggressive coverages, which required people rotating on the backside. You're asking Bogey to rotate, which he wasn't always doing, or Trey as a low <laughs> man, or Sadiq Bey as a low Sadiq man. Bay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's particularly in Sadiq Bey, it was a lot of issues with him, but it, it was a, a big change for a lot of guys on the roster. Um, I mean, even I think last year, Trey showed a lot of effort defensively, especially when it mattered most. Uh, I do think, you know, him doing that more consistently probably does help a little bit more than Dyson doing it. But I mean, I 100 percent agree. I think he has a chance to make all defensive team next year, 100 um, percent. But I think most importantly, he just unlocks a lot of versatility for the Hawks and all the other moves they've made to complement it. Um, we're in a much more versatile position than we were last season. I think that's the most important thing. We were locked into one style of play really on both ends. And yeah, it's a lot more different things that I think Quinn can do with this roster. No, I totally agree. And just the not to beat this drum too much, but the lack of guys who you have to be terrified about defensively um, and just more depth. I mean, we've covered that ad nauseum. I know you have in your content too. Mm-hmm. Like they just have more depth across. The board. And they're also, they're also bigger. And that's one thing that um, I, you were in some of, those press, some of those press conferences too. One of the only things Quinn's candid about ever is that he he, he kept saying last year that like how small they were. Like in not, not like that in that direct of a way, but he'd make these little comments about how they were small basically yeah. uh, um, in the front court and out of necessity. And, you know, I, I'm not someone that believes that you have to have certain size, every position. Like there's this whole, you have to have a seven foot center. It's like, well, no, you don't have to, but when you're so small at every single front court spot, mm. it puts you in a bad spot. Like when Sadiq's trying to, you know, Sadiq's six, um, as big as he is thickness wise, he's six, seven, he's playing a power forward spot. He can't really rotate and do those, you know, you're playing as small as they were. Veet's playing small forward. They're playing West Matthews at the four. And they're just bigger across the board now. And Risa Shea, who I know is really thin, but he's obviously really long compared to mm-hmm. what they had before. Anyway, um, Dice is the head of that, though. So it, I, I don't want to ever, ever put on one guy to be like, okay, it's your job to take us from 27th to 18th defensively. But mm-hmm. truly, he's the kind of guy that could make it, you know, it's obviously a rough, but like a five, six, seven, eight spot jump just by himself. If he's playing... 70 70 games of 30 minutes a night the gap between him and what they had before it cannot be overstated defensively how big that gap is and you know offensively you got you got to fill DeJounte's shoes that's not a small thing we talked about bogey earlier but yeah I'm looking forward to uh watching Dyson Daniels play basketball because he's just the guy that we've all been talking about that they've needed for a long time like a legitimate game changer at the point of attack defensively has been the call for what two years maybe longer since the line left basically yeah it's a massive (laughs) massive gap and I think I kind of want to ask your thoughts about Kobe as well, as we oh, yeah. kind of like talk about those guys who can set that tone defensively. I, when I was at games, I would find myself on the defense when just gravita- gravitating towards him. And like I had like a three minute clip of me just recording him defensively, all the little things he does, like stunning at the defender, sort of like using his leverage, moving his feet. He's special. And I, and I think we were we were honestly robbed. Like, I don't know what it is about the Hawks in summer league, 
we haven't had a good <laughs> summer league stint since I can't even remember. But it's like since the Sharif Cooper uh, disaster class, it's been bad. Like with injury <laughs> luck, all sorts yeah. of stuff. Um, and I really think Kobe would have set a tone for what type of season he could possibly have. I think he would have really simplified it for Riza Shea, Muhammad Gay. Everyone was over-indexed, just like he talked about like last season where guys were over-indexed defensively. I think that's what it was in summer league as well. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, like, where do you think Kobe fits in, in this rotation? And and what do you think he could have done for someone like Riza Shea? I think that Kobe right now is the backup point guard uh, as it stands. Like, again, that's that's a think, not a no, because mm. – it's hard to get intel stuff in July and August about the team because they're they're not gonna they're not they haven't practiced together yet all that stuff like people are really 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 eager to like write their depth chart out and be like all right this is what's gonna happen and I I have my guesses you know uh, but I, I'm not gonna be as firm with stuff until I have heard it from a coach or heard it from somebody that's around but I think logically on the roster right now like he he's the backup point guard I mean maybe be Dyson a little bit you you mentioned him earlier in this conversation Dyson got some point guard skills I'm I think if you played Dyson and Bogey together that would work. Yeah, but Dyson alone to run the offense is not quite what I would mm -hmm. want to do. Um, but on Kobe, I think we all were really impressed defensively. I mean, he, you know, that College Park churn, you know, of um, in a good way. I was really impressed by that because you know I, I remember uh, you're 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 a lot younger than I am. I remember when the Hawks very number one didn't have a G League team. Then they had the partnership with Erie, and the guys were so far away. And it's like light and day, night and day now with like how much they prioritize College Park. And last year was like the shiny example of that. V. Krejci, of course, mm -hmm. is the biggest example probably, but Kobe going from where Kobe – and look, Kobe was already going to be a good defender, I think, coming out of college. He had the tools for it. But him, because of College Park, hitting the ground running at the NBA level and being able to defend at a – I would I would call it good level, mm -hmm. even as a rookie. And, yeah, guard, small guard, all that stuff. But he's not that small, number one. But, yeah, I think he's, he's not quite on the level of Dyson as a prospect defensively. But I do think that he can be – especially if he's playing point guard – strongly above average defensively and he he also works really hard he played really hard you you mentioned it too but like his screen navigation was really good as a rookie he'll, he'll get up into you he's not afraid of that he'll get beat which is a good like he's not afraid to get beat is what i should say like yeah. he's not going to play off of you because he's worried about you beating him um by the way I, Kobe, I know i'm a michigan guy but this is independent of that kobe's culture stuff is fantastic like the hawks love him as a guy as like a guy you know, makeup wise on mm -hmm. court off court and that shows up defensively because I don't think he has the – how do I put this? I don't think he has, like, the top 20 NBA draft pick ego to him. Everybody's got an ego. Don't get me wrong. All these guys have egos. They have to get to this point. But, like, I don't think he's, like, I'm the guy on offense kind of guy. You know, like, I think he's, like, I'll do whatever the team's got to win kind of guy, which is, by the way, Reese Chase the same way as we'll get into in a second. But I feel like Kobe's going to be good defensively, and then it's, it's, it's definitely a TBD offensively right now. And I'll be honest about that. Even as someone who liked that draft pick a lot, um, he didn't play enough last year to really know mm -hmm. on offense in particular. And when he was playing, he was playing mostly with Trey or with DeJounte or with Trent Forrest. And he wasn't like the guy on a point guard. And that's a big TBD. And is the shot going to go in and all that stuff? But I think the finishing's legit, et cetera. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you think? Cause I feel like I'm excited to watch Kobe hopefully be healthy. I mean, he had the shoulder subluxation this summer that you talked about with summer league. Uh, by the end of summer league, it was pretty dire out in Las Vegas. I have to say like that, that third, fourth, fifth game was tough. Um, but all signs point to Kobe being back and being ready to go. So like, are you as excited as I am? Cause I'm pretty excited to watch him yeah. in a setting that means something provided he's like a knock on wood provided he's healthy. Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, you're a Michigan guy, so I watched a good amount of <laughs> tape. Um, but he was – just by the numbers, I mean, he was one of four prospects in that class to shoot higher than 70% at the rim, 40% yep. in the paint, 35% from mid-range, and 30% from three. But a lot of his rim attempts were self-generated. Like less than 25% were, were assisted. So he's shown ability to get downhill. He's shown ability to finish. I don't think he's shown it on the NBA level yet, and I think some of that is physicality, some of that is comfortability. Like you said um, – he, he missed the vast majority of his year, you know, um, with various injuries. I think a lot of guys are, like, quick to label Hawks players as injury prone or, like, we have something wrong with the medical staff. I, I wouldn't go there. Um, but I do think it's it's a, an important season for him because I think Keaton Wallace is also, you know, a, a great signing for the Hawks because he has yeah. that sort of experience in the G League. I think he's a mature guard. Um, I think you could see that he's not – Again, you probably want Bogey on the floor with even someone like Keaton Wallace because, you know, in the summer league, he wasn't able to consistently generate shots for guys. But I think he can step in, you know, if there's if there's a minutes needed or if, if uh, Kobe needs some more support. Um, 
But yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely excited for him. I think the Hawks kind of have like a two headed goat with like Dyson Daniels and, and Kobe <laughs> Bufkin in terms of guys who can like sort of oscillate between these different roles, but also give you some real like resistance at the defensive end. I think, you know, yeah. if, if need be, you could roll out both of them and really cause havoc. And, you know, they're going to get after it. They're, they're kind of like both have like that pit bull mentality where I think they're really just going to get up in the people. So, I mean, I, I think there's a shift with, with what the Hawks are doing. They get a little bit younger, but. Um, I, I love it. I, I love to see. I would love to see Kobe get the t- sort of like opportunity I think he needs to grow into the player that I think he can be, and I think that means him being the backup point guard. All right, that is it for part one of this two-part conversation with myself and David. We have more to come. Part two should be available in your same podcast feed of choice right now, whether it be Apple or Spotify, Overcast. Also on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. Tell your friends, leave five-star ratings and reviews. Also follow the show on Twitter slash X at Locked on Hawks. Follow me there at BT Roll and then check out my non-podcast work at patreon.com slash BT Roll. I do appreciate everyone listening to the podcast. Part two is available right now in the same podcast feed. And we'll see you all next time.